growing up in the Catholic Church, the uh, thing that young boys, grade school age, uh, looked forward to uh, was becoming a, uh, an altar server. You would assist the priest um, at the altar. Uh, lay people were not allowed in the sanctuary, so the altar server was the one who took care of things that the priest wasn't going to take care of. And I remember about, I don't remember the grade, uh, but I, this is what I remember. I almost flunked. I almost didn't make it as an altar server. Uh, because what you had to do was memorize what they called the prayers at the foot of the altar. It was like what we do for the call to worship. These were the call, the call to worship prayers that the priest and the altar server did. Nobody else did. In fact, it's all in Latin. Uh, so nobody else knew what was going on um, at all. Uh, but I had a terrible time memorizing uh, the prayers that we were supposed to pray uh, until an older altar server said, well, look at it this way. The priest is a little hard of hearing anyway. So all you have to make sure that you do is say the opening words so he knows you got started on your prayer. And the words were in tropigo out of our day, well, I can imagine. I'm 70 years old and still remember <laughs> that, right? It's a song that says, to the altar of God I go, is what it said. And once you get past those words, then just mumble everything. You know, blah, 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 you know, say it as fast as you could because the priest was only interested in getting the prayers done fast. And then when you got to the end, somewhere along the way, after an appropriate period of time, you just kind of say very loudly, amen. And then the priest would go along and he would do it almost exactly the same thing, basically. He would mumble out his prayers too. Uh, but I remember that uh, at a young age, any of us, that uh, the ritual of the worship was always something that I looked uh, forward to being engaged in. Um, although, um, over a period of time, um, I guess that I lost uh, the, the, the sense, not of the sacred, but it's like, wow, you just have all these rules and all these things that you have to follow. Uh, and so I, I ended up really not liking uh, it too much. I remember um, I was in college, actually, uh, and my home uh, parish uh, an associate pastor came to the home parish, and he basically would whiz through the prayers of the service, uh, but would just drone on and on like I sometimes do in my sermon. Uh, and Steve reminded me that a couple of weeks ago <laughs> I went too long, so uh, sorry, Steve. Uh, that uh, that it just it, it was just like uh, too much of the ritual. It's sort of like what happened with the Reformation, right? That um, with all of the Baroque uh, accoutrements of many of the churches that you still see uh, in Europe, uh, that the reformers came along and said, you know, this is just idol worship. So the statues and the paintings and, uh, and some of the churches you did see, especially in the Netherlands, just were stark, stark churches, white, white walls, hardly no, uh, decoration at all, and just a bare cross compared to what Catholics used was the crucifix with the body of Jesus on the cross. Protestants used just the bare uh, cross. Um, in any event, uh, there was a, a loss of a ritual, uh, of uh, all of the accoutrements that went along uh, with the ritual, and it got stripped down to the bare uh, necessities. To me, it was very intellectual at that point. So you could approach things from a purely intellectual perspective and not really from a more sensual perspective, meaning the smell of incense, the, the singing, uh, and the, all the other ritual that went uh, along with it. I'm telling you all of that because um, as I uh, became older, it was easy uh, to look at people who uh, were much more pious and much more uh, devotional about their, serve, their church uh, service, um, especially what drove me just crazy, and I still see this today 
uh, in the more conservative a Catholic church anyway, where you had to make sure that your hands, you know, you couldn't fold your hands, you couldn't, you know, couldn't put them in your pockets. You had to have your hands because it was supposed to be like directed up to heaven. And you had to have the proper thumb over thumb. I don't know which way it was supposed to go. Seriously, that you, had, you got slapped if you had the wrong thumb over the wrong thumb. Uh, and so, and today, I, I just drives me crazy to see people, you know, so uh, pious and so devotional uh, that, uh, you know, that they're, they're, I remember seeing people walking down the aisle on their knees, especially if you go to Mexico City and visit the Shrine of Guadalupe, people walking across the plaza on their knee, and they're just like, wow, I just don't get it at all. I remember visiting um, a Hispanic church in downtown Phoenix, the oldest, uh, second oldest church in Phoenix, St. Uh, Immaculate uh, Heart of Mary Church. Um, and I walked into the church and there were like five statues of Mary in this church. And I thought, isn't one good enough that you have to have five statues of Mary? And I said this to the person, to a friend who was showing me around and he kind of looked at me shocked and he said, well, you just don't understand Hispanic culture that, you know, this statue is to the sorrowful mother. And so people go to her when they are grieving and in sorrow. And this statue of Mary shows her this way. And so, and it just like went in one year, not the other year. And this, that piety and that devotionalism, uh, to this day, I can't, it, it just is too much. The rote prayers that people will say, um, when I used to go to, uh, to uh, do funerals and go to the service before the night before the funeral. Uh, and uh, the traditional Catholic prayer was always the rosary. Um, and it was just like people would just rattle off. Hey, I'm Mary, it's all very small. Blah, blah, blah. And it was just this fact, and it just turned my stomach, uh, the devotionalism uh, that I saw. And, and yet on the other side, um, I remember no offense to anyone, and please, this is really, really a stereotypical statement that I'm going to make. I just wonder, I would always have the, the teen and the young adult service at St. Patrick's, which was on Sunday evening. And to be honest with you, sometimes I would just ask myself, did you look at yourself in the mirror before you came to church? I mean, in halter tops and shorts, and it just... It's like, where was the respect? Where was, where was the, you know, the idea that you were in public and that, that you should, you know, I, I, if you've ever been to an African-American worship service, either Protestant or Catholic, my God, they dressed to the nines. They got gloves on and the women wore hats. When was the last time women you wore hats to church? Probably, Rebecca, probably never. When I was 11 or 12 at Easter. You, you, you wore <laughs> at Easter. Easter. I wore a walk at last week. Did you? Well, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> but, you know, and I mean, I, you know, women don't even wear pants to church, for God's sake, right? And so it's just like the casualness that we... Now, now you see, the point that I'm trying to get is, here's the two people going into the temple to pray. And one goes into the temple, and he looks over the tax collectors. Now, the tax collector is probably not dressed badly. He's a tax collector, for God's sake. And he probably lived in a pretty good home because, well, you know what tax collectors do, right? That's what, that's what the Pharisee is saying. You know, he's, he's equivalent to the robes and the derelicts because he associates with the Romans by collecting and handling, collecting Roman coins and handling Roman coins. And well, look at him over there. He just is, you know, he's so pious. He's just beating his breast. And look at that guy over there. And well, you know, God, I, I do what I'm supposed to do. I follow the Torah. I'm, I'm, I'm doing all of this. Uh, because this is what I, I believe being faithful means. And the Pharisee is just one of those pious people who so pious that he's beating his breast and Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. And it's just like those are the kind of people that just drive me up a wall because not that they're not 
genuine and more serious, but wow, this is overboard. And, and the tax collector is just a little bit overboard viewed from the perspective of the Pharisee. But the tax collector, he's probably, even though it doesn't say it in the text, he's probably got an eye over. Because right when you're, when you're in church or at the temple, you always have your eye over, you know, you look at other people, right? Be honest. You look at other people, especially, you know, especially if we were in a large congregation. I remember sitting in the back of the congregation watching people go in and you kind of, well, the point, the point of the story is, you see, It seems in this parable that we're being asked to stand with the tax collector because he's the one who, in some perspective, is more genuine in his piety because he recognizes that he's a sinner. Where the Pharisee doesn't recognize that he's a sinner, but let's face it, both are there in prayer. Both have come to God with their prayer. So you see how easy it is to judge one over the other? And that's almost what the parable suggests, that Jesus is saying, right? Um, those who humble themselves will be exalted, and those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and so it almost is inviting us to stand with the humbled one. But you see, in standing with the humbled one, are we not exalting ourselves? Because we're willing to pat ourselves on the back and say, oh, we are so good. Because we're siding with somebody who's a tax collector. And isn't that good? And you see, Parable is not so much anymore about the two people. It's about us. It's about the way we are so quick, as I kind of explain my story, I would hazard a guess in our honesty about it and our transparency about it. But we've done those things too. Right? At least at one time, confession. I said, wow, you know that line between being homeless and having a house to live in is so fine. Oh, thank God I'm on this side, not that side. I've seen some of the kids, thank God you don't live in Haiti where your daughter lives there. You hear how that sounds? Thank God we're not in prayer. Thank God we're not those people who obviously, you know, pride themselves, pride themselves on being good Christians. And yet, just by because somebody's skin color is different, their gender is different, their sexual orientation is different, they demean and degrade everything. It's easy to point the finger of self righteousness at others. But how willing are we to point the finger of self righteousness at ourselves? Sorry, one of the writers that I meet uh, in preparation for the sermon, uh, she was sharing this parable with the children, and she said she asked the question which of these two do you think was loved by God? Think about it. The first response will be textbook. One of the little children yelled out, both. How comfortable are we saying both are loved by God? Both of us. Because at any moment, we could be one or the other. And we too can be so self righteous. That we look at those people. Did you pass by the year before you came to church? <laughs> How come I'm so pious and nobody else is? 
parables for us 